It's time for the Unnamed Swoter Podcast, a podcast so good it doesn't need a name. So without any further ado, here's your host, JD. Take it away, Johnny. Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 33 of the Unnamed Swotor Podcast, recorded on February 9th, 2014. I'm your host, JD, a.k.a. Gaddick Teague, and in today's episode, we have a litany of topics to discuss, hot topics, throughout the community. I finally found a transcription of the Q&A that happened last week in Arizona, thanks to the Utinacast guys and Adundai, especially, who's the one that transcribed it. So we'll be talking about that. The producer's roadmap was released on Monday, and there's lots of stuff to talk about there. Well, there's not really lots of stuff to talk about there, so that's something to talk about. And we'll be talking about class changes, specifically the changes to scoundrels and operatives. Are they OP now? Do they need more changes? So it looks to be a jam-packed episode today. Let's force sleep right in. Red 2, I've got a topic coming in hot, requesting clearance to engage. Lock as foils and attack positions. You are cleared to discuss. As I discussed last week, the Arizona Cantina happened on February 31st in February 31st, January 31st, it's actually a time-traveling uh, cantina, it happened in the future, and we are hearing about it now, but anyway, uh, Duty Die of the Utini Guild was able to do a transcription of the Q&A and re- released it this week. As with any uh, second-hand sources, the validity can be questioned here. I really don't like to take anything out of uh, out of context. It, I'd like to hear the actual events before really making a decision as to exactly what was said or how it was said. You know, it's hard to tell inflection or things like that. But we can go over what was said and see what we can infer from the questions. So I think I'm just going to go down the list of questions and discuss the answers. First question, is the desert of the real in the western portion of the Dune Sea a, on Tatooine a reference to the Matrix? They would never put a reference from another movie into Star Wars, obviously being facetious, whatever, nothing interesting there. Are there any plans to increase the legacy cap beyond 50? Provide any incentives to attain that level, such as legacy banks, so that you don't have to mail credits, your alts, etc. The answer to this was they'd love to do that at some point, but technically very challenging and likely to happen in the near future. And this is obviously a textbook example of one of their stock responses that they like to give to their Q&As, and I'll discuss this more in the next segment, but I think it's total BS at this point for things that we've been asking for since launch to still be considered technically very challenging, and I'll explain why in the next segment. But I, I personally think this would be really cool. I think legacy banks are obviously a popular thing that people would like. It is annoying to have to log into like eight different characters to find out, oh, who did I put this, you know, uh, cartel market item in the bank of? Because I have like six alts that have pretty much stocked banks of just gear I'm getting from the packs, and I might stop buying packs because I just don't have places to put stuff. So I think a legacy bank would be a great way to solve that. And, obviously, if I'm not buying packs, that's money that I could be spending in the game that they can get. So I think this was a uh, very upsetting answer, and hopefully we'll see something like this in the far future. Maybe the end of the year? Who knows. Are there any concepts in the works to introduce new character class across both factions? This is a question that gets asked pretty much every time. And if you are going to go to a cantina, I just highly recommend that you go back and look at questions that have already been asked and uh, look at the responses. If you didn't, if they didn't give a response last time, they're not going to give a response this time. You're not going to pry any inf- information out of them, especially in the Q&A format. Usually in the Q&A, they're very guarded. And there is the opportunity to talk to them and, you know, just mingle and ask them questions outside of the Q&A. And I think they're more willing to give... Uh, in-depth responses to questions. So if you want to ask questions that have already been asked, that's fine, but please don't do it in the Q&A segment, because it just kind of wastes everyone's time. But I digress. Are there any... Okay. There are no plans at this time, mostly due to the amount of content 
that each class and companion stories provide. Companions are our big thing. I know when a lot of people talk about adding a new class, they always say, well, we could just start it at 55 and you wouldn't have to do all that story content. But you would have to add in the story content for all the companions and things like that. So that's, that's kind of stuff that myself and probably a lot of other people don't necessarily think of when you think of adding in a new class. You'd have to add in new companions and things like that. And they have said that maybe we could see new advanced classes added so that they wouldn't have to do the more companion focused story stuff. So that makes sense. And maybe we'll see a hero class that has a litany of companions from other classes maybe? Maybe you could have Risha and uh, Vet and whoever else to be companions for one person. Eh, maybe that's lore breaking, who knows. Has Bioware thought of implementing a lifetime subscription? They talked about a pre-launch, but decided against it, and it's unlikely. Uh, uh, I think lifetime subscriptions are very interesting. They definitely lead to some, some good upfront cash. But I think a lot of baggage comes with lifetime subscriptions. A lifetime su subscription kind of gives you a lot of, um feeling of ownership, like you've kind of bought into the game, it's almost like you're investing in the game, and I don't think that's something that Bioware necessarily wants to encourage and foster with something like a lifetime subscription, so I don't I don't see it as a bad thing that they're not, they're not doing it. I'll stay subscribed for as long as I see the game going in the right direction, and as long as I'm having fun of the game, so they're going to get my money either way. I, eh. If they edit it, it'd be cool. If not, that's fine too. What happens to Revan? Now this is an interesting one. The uh, answer written here is keep playing to find out. Uh, I'm not sure how that was said. That was probably said in a very um, coy manner. And we'll be talking a little bit about Revan in the next segment with the producer's roadmap. But I think Revan... I, I thought, as you know, that the GSI would be the next uh, endgame bad guy. I thought that would be cool. But I totally forgot about Revan. We totally still have Revan in the game, and Revan makes complete sense to be the next important figure in SWOTOR. That would be cool, and I'm sure a lot of people would be very interested to see how the Revan story plays out. What are the plans to improve guild functionality in-game? Guild email, capital ships, etc. Currently nothing is specifically planned. A lot of the features requested would be technically challenging. Now. This is obviously very upsetting, and if you listen to my episode last week, I said that there would be a guild, a super guild functionality update at some point this year, and from the sounds of this, I, again, it's a secondhand source, so I can't say exactly how it was said or what was exactly said, but it sounds like that we won't be getting something like this this year, and that's extremely upsetting. And I was going to save this rant for the next segment, but I guess I'll do it now. It It's at this point in the game, the game is over two years old. And for features that we've been asking for since launch, so over two years ago, to still be classified as technically challenging is just a farce at this point. Like, you see indie developers with, you know, five people creating full games in two years. In under two years. Full, full featured, awesome games in under two years. To say that something is still technically challenging as the reason we're not seeing it is just total BS. If we're not going to see something, just come out and say it. Don't just say it's a technical challenge and that's why you're not doing it. If it was a technical challenge, you know, two, a year and a half ago, fine. Six months into the game, you're still figuring things out, fine. A year ago, fine. Six months ago, fine. But we're getting to the point where technically challenging is no longer an excuse. You've worked with this game for long enough. You've worked in this game for long enough. And I don't think I'm being ridiculous here and saying that technically challenging is no longer our problem. And it should be no... And it should no longer be your problem. We're not asking for something that's radically different. We're not asking, or at least I'm not asking you, to change your engine. We're asking for some simple features that are in other MMOs and have been implemented in other MMOs in a much faster fashion than have been implemented in this MMO. So I don't see where the disconnect is. You've had time to play with the game. You've had time to develop features that are technically challenging. Was GSF simple? Was that an easy thing to, to create? Or was that technically challenging? Just say that this is not on your, your immediate list of things to do. So just say it's not important. That's fine. Just be realistic and be honest. At this point, the technically challenging thing is just totally ridiculous. And it, it really upsets me when I see the technically challenging thing brought up for things that we've been asking for this long. It's it's just ridiculous, and that that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm ridiculous. Alright, next. 
Is dual spec, multi spec coming? It's something they'd love to do. This is another thing that we've been asking for since launch, but it's not going to happen in the short term. Now they they keep they have like all these different ways of saying time frames, so it's hard to say what's coming when. They said with the guild functionality thing, nothing is specifically planned. For this one, they said not going to have it in the short term. It's hard to place where things are going to be coming, but I really think dual spec, multi spec would be a nice feature to add to the game. I recently, I, I'm a person who plays different classes if I want to do different roles, but I recently decided to have my tank also be a DPS so that we can change in 16 man fights where we need three tanks versus we only need two tanks so having that ability to switch DPS on the fly is uh, something that I'm just now getting into and it is really annoying to have to respec skills one by one and have to switch in gear one by one and you know switching in gear isn't even the big part and I know they've said that the big thing they want to do is make sure that with dual spec you also get the gear manager and things like that but if they just added a respec button I could take the the one minute to switch all my gear and make sure it's all set so I, I that's this also is something that I hope we see if not in the short term in the long term next up when do we get a pink and black die and the answer is eventually if there's a color combination we can give to players the die we'll get it uh, obviously they're more than happy to make money and they are going to add all sorts of different color combinations so they can resell some similar but different things so dyes crystals things like that uh, I would like to see at some point maybe them adding the color customizer like they had during the beta of Galactic Starfighter where it was a color wheel and you can just kind of shift your colors all around but probably never see that because the cartel market but if you want something customizable, want a certain look, want something, Bioware is always listening. There is a forum for that. You can tweet SWOTOR and whoever the community managers, things like that, and they will definitely get to working on that. If you talk to Akiwas over on the SWOTOR subreddit, you'll hear about the gun that he wanted and he asked for at the New York Cantina, and it came a couple months after. So they're listening for things, especially for the cartel market. Is there anything that Bioware is excited about that they'd like to tell us? Bruce is working on a blog post that covers the coming year in Swotor in the same vein as the summer of Swotor post made previously. Because it's for the year, it won't be detailed, but lays out the plan for the year ahead. Really? The year ahead? The blog is scheduled to be posted last Monday, and it was, and that will be the subject of the next segment. Are there any plans to make light side, dark side progression relevant at Endgame? No, as this is intentional. Ever since launch, the goal was to never let light side, dark side options affect anything at Endgame. Otherwise, people may have been restricted from playing Endgame because they weren't the correct side of the Force. This is something I agree with. It would be nice if they added the gray area relics, because that's really the only thing that I kind of feel hampered by when I don't have light side, dark side points on new alts. But other than that, it's all cosmetic stuff, and I hope it stays that way because I want to play the story how I want to play my story and not how I have to play the story. Can Bioware give players something to spend capped reputation tokens on? Sell them to vendors for credits. Yes, that's what you do with them. The credits are actually kind of decent, so do that if you're hoarding rep. They're probably never going to increase rep in the future. They'll probably just add more rep grinds for you to do, so just sell those bad boys. With new GSF gameplay modes coming out, is there anything involving an assault on an enemy capital ship to take out specific objectives, turret shields, etc.? No, not for 2.6. There will be more things coming for GSF in the future, no details at this time. That was obviously something that would be very popular throughout the Hotor community. It's very Star Wars-y, so hopefully in the future we know we probably have a payload map coming, but that is not what they're talking about here. An assault on the enemy capital ship would probably be interesting, uh, very different from what we have, that's for sure. So, I like to see it added, but probably won't be coming anytime soon, which is a Bioware staple, obviously. Any plans to add joystick control to GSF? It was underestimated how much interest there would be in joystick control, and the game isn't built to be played with a joystick. Some of the controls would need to be changed functionally to allow that to happen. 
It's not likely to happen anytime soon, and I would think this is not likely to happen anytime at all. I think they want to encourage players to play with the mouse and keyboard. I think they want to keep the play field even. I don't think they want to make joystick controls like the be-all, end-all, like you play better with the joystick. I think it's a lot of work for them to do, and I, I think they just want a uniformity between all their game modes. You use the the uh, keyboard and mouse for all the other ways to play the game, PvP, PvE, leveling. I don't think they want to encourage a separate control scheme just for Galactic Starfighter. It seems uh, a little bit of a waste to me. Has there been any discussion about interactive apps to send companions out on crew skills, etc.? They've been talking about it a lot and would love to do this. However, there are technical challenges surrounding this and it would impact server performance, thus alternate solutions would need to be found. It's a question of time and resources again. This one, I can see where maybe you can blame some technical challenges. You know, we have been asking for this for a long time, but honestly, this would be something totally out of their comfort zone, something they're totally not accustomed to do. So yes, there could be technical challenges with this. They have to interface the the app with the real game if they want to do something like this, and I could see where technical challenges could arrive from that. Also, this could be really crippling to the economy. If you really want to hear about that, I would encourage you to go listen to the UtiniCast. They have a uh, discussion about this topic particularly, uh, about how an app could really harm the economy. So, check that out. It's a good listen. Has there been any thought of light and dark side alignments with companions? Uh, whatever, doesn't really matter. It's been thought about and was sort of implemented, probably talking about a specific companion who has a light side and dark side uh, option with them, uh, but they don't want to give any spoilers. I won't give any spoilers either, but there is a companion who has a light side and a dark side. Will I ever see walkers in-game that players can control? No, you're more likely to see walkers in the game than you are to actually drive them. This is a little upsetting and something that I talked about last week, I believe. It would be awesome if you can drive vehicles in some fashion in SOTOR. Uh, I discussed about how WoW really changed in Wrath of the Lich King by adding a lot of these vehicle type stuffs where you can drive around catapults and tanks and things like that. And I think that would be really awesome. And it would be really interesting if they added something like that mechanically to the Old Republic. Is guild membership cap of 500 going to be raised at this time? No, due to technical difficulties that would decrease server performance. Um, I would suggest to anyone who has problems with this to just set up another guild with a custom chat channel. Seems to be the best way to handle it. I would be more interested of them adding the uh, guilds alliances and guilds rivalries so that you can have guilds on both sides and just talk between them. That would be nice. The technical difficulties that you keep referring to, are these in relation to the game engine? Each time they give that response, it's due to a different te technical difficulty, such as architecture or something else. And I already discussed the whole thing about the technical difficulties, so I'm not gonna bring that up again. What is the most popular content? Bywar obviously cannot disclose information about metrics, because they're part of a publicly traded company. They can't really give details and all that good stuff. When is the Data Crown Relic going to be upgraded? Uh, Bioware is unsure at this time. It would be nice if they upgraded it. A uh, question about people's personal preferences, so I'm not going to talk about that. Are there plans to add anything for those who remain neutrally aligned? It's been discussed, but it's never made it into their schedule. Uh, would be nice if they added it in, but if it's going to be a hassle and take a lot of time, then I really don't care. At the end of the McKeb and Oricon storylines, we see the Empire heading in a different direction. Are we going to see more of that, and are we going to see the companion stories continued? If you continue to play the game, and see the story as it unfolds, you'll have a good time. As for companion stories, they most likely won't be developed due to the time and resources it would take, where the average player would only get to see one or two of them. Game Update 2.7 is the beginning of a story arc that will go throughout the rest of the year. The conclusion of the story arc is going to be epic and lead into a big announcement. I'll be talking about that next segment when I talk about the roadmap, the producer's roadmap to 2014. 
right after the break. Now, part two of the one-two punch this week is the producer's roadmap to 2014. This was released on Monday, exactly as they said in the Q&A, so that's uh, impressive on them actually getting something out on time. And in the producer's roadmap, they laid out what will be coming in 2014, as the name will. They laid out what will be coming up till June 10th in 2014, because that's as far as they go in this producer's roadmap to 2014 that will lay out the plans for all of the year, which ends in June. But that joke's been made in so many other places that I'm not gonna harp on it. So my schedule that I laid out last week actually was not all that off. There were definitely some things that I did not expect, and there were some things uh, in different places, but they announced the next three updates, basically, the next three game updates, and I actually picked a lot of stuff for where it will be coming. So the February 4th one is already out, that was the Galactic Starfighter available to free-to-play players, the release of the Bomber, the updated scoreboard, the Kuat Drive Yards Flashpoint, and the Battle Record. And I think a lot of these have received some positive reviews, I think Patch 2.6 is a very good patch, especially for people who like Galactic Starfighter. I think what may have surprised people was the fact that Kuwa Drive Yards is an excellent leveling flashpoint. I know a lot of people have been talking about power leveling just for Kuat, just because it's quick, it's pretty easy, and it gives really good uh, experience for those who are just looking to power level a character up. So 2.6 I think has been very, very positive for the game, and I'm, I'm happy people enjoy it. Obviously no major PvP or PvE updates, which upsetting and we'll talk about that in a second but overall I think this patch was very good for the game uh, a mini update March 14th to 17th double XP weekend I know a lot of people only play uh, leveling characters during the double XP weekends I am, will be looking forward to probably finally getting my operative and my scoundrel up to 55 and seeing how far I can get my uh, I'm not sure which character I want to go with on the other one. Maybe let's, I'll get back into Galactic Starfighter, because I've kind of taken a break from Starfighter. It's um, the, one of the first things that goes when I don't really have a ton of time to play the game. Obviously, my operations time comes first, and then maybe some leveling in there, and then Galactic Starfighter. So I've cut back pretty much on Galactic Starfighter for the time being, but March 14th to 17th seems like a good time to see if I can get a character from 25 to 55 in a weekend. Probably not, but I'll try. Then April 8th. Now you may notice, hey, time between February 4th and April 8th, that's that's not eight weeks, that's nine weeks. Well, as I sort of discussed last week, they would be reevaluating the eight week content cycle and they have decided to make the eight week content cycle actually a nine week content cycle. And they say by doing this, they can increase the quality of gameplay content and they can hopefully squash those bugs that have been finding their way into game. I'm a little skeptical with regards to that. They say they will be doing minor patches every three weeks instead of the two weeks as they're doing now, and they say by doing so they can catch those minor bugs in those minor patches, and I am, like I said, skeptical. Maybe we'll be seeing more use of the public test server, Maybe because the public test server gets used more often, more people will do it, because right now, not many people do it at all. And some of the things we do catch make it into game, which happens, but is definitely uh, not the best looking thing. So hopefully the extra week allows them to make some of those changes and fix things up. Honestly, if we get more meat in a patch, I am happy to let them go to nine weeks. That's fine. But on April 8th, game update 2.7, we'll see... Nightmare Mode Dread Fortress and a new tier of gear, so this will probably be a half tier just like the Kill Dragon stuff. The new Hotball map on Quest, just like I predicted. The new Galactic Starfighter Battle Zone, this will probably be the Capture the Flag or Cargo Hold, whatever the data mined 
and the thing we saw from the PTS is. Don't know exactly what kind of gameplay that will be, but it should be interesting. And we will see two new flashpoints on Tython and Korriban, where the Empire and Republic confront each other directly, initiating a new storyline that will span updates across the entire year until its galaxy-shaking finale. And this is uh, very exciting, and when I first saw this, I was like, cool, there'll be a flashpoint on Tython for the Republic and a flashpoint on Korriban for the Empire. But then, you know, thinking about it and seeing what other people had to say, it could very well be a Empire Flashpoint on Tython and a Republic Flashpoint on Korriban, setting up a major conflict between the Empire and the Republic. That could be very interesting. Putting the pieces together from the Q&A and from this, I would bet that the new endgame, the galaxy-shaking finale, and the uh, new storyline that will span across the entire year has something to do with Revan, because that was sort of hinted at, and Revan, major character, major lore character that spans all of the KOTOR games, and is a character that a lot of people want to see where the story goes with. I know the Foundry Flashpoint, uh, spoiler alert here, at the end of the Foundry Flashpoint, you see uh, him disappear instead of being killed, so we'll see uh, where he went after disappearing from the Foundry so many years ago. Now, I've let my feelings be heard several times on the state of night remote operations, and this is kind of them going with the old standby instead of uh, innovating or doing anything different, and we'll see, and we'll talk about June 10th right now, Game Update 2.8, they will also be releasing the Dread Palace operation. So not only are they using night remote operations to be considered major endgame PvE content, major endgame raid content, they have split up Dread Fortress and Dread Palace, now, if this means that each one is going to be polished a little bit better, that's cool. It also kind of splits things up, so progression won't be so, um, taxing. There won't be ten bosses just dumped on the community to deal with. You know, you can do five and five. It makes things a little easier, but if we just end up with the Dread Fortress being completed by a lot of people night one, that's not a good, good example of how night remotes should be handled. So, hopefully these night remotes will actually be nightmares and we will see some impossible bosses because we know how much the community loves those. Now also under Game Update 2.8 they say that it will be the biggest update up to this point. We will reveal more information once we get a bit closer. Now what I'm hoping for here is that 2.8 will be also the release of the new story mode and hard mode new operations, so something different to uh, really give more endgame PvEers more stuff to do, because right now, endgame PvEers who aren't necessarily hard mode players that just do story modes, because story modes are fun, and there's nothing wrong with that. That should be a, a game style that should be encouraged by the community, because I know there are people who feel like, if I don't have a ton of hours to, to devote to the game, I sh can't be doing hard modes, or I shouldn't be doing hard modes. I don't necessarily agree with that, but there's nothing you can really do to uh, change people's minds with regards to that and that should be encouraged so I'm hoping that they add new story mode and hard mode flash points and I also hope that this will be the release of season 2 the start of ranked season 2 where they uh, do something dramatically different they're saying this is gonna be the biggest patch to this point I don't know exactly what they're talking about with regards to uh, update to this point is it going to be bigger than rise of the hot cartel is it going to be expansion like Rise of the Hot Cartel? They say during 2014 we will see two digital expansions, one on the scope of Rise of the Hut Cartel and one on the scope of Galactic Starfighter. A lot of the rumor as to what we'll be seeing for the expansion that's kind of like Galactic Starfighter is that we'll be seeing pod racing or swoop racing or something like that added to the game, which could be very cool. Many games are obviously something that a lot of players want and a lot of players do to kill time and keep playing the game so so more power to them there and on the other hand we'll see a story expansion with the same uh, level progression and things like that which we will probably have to pay for on the scale of rise of the hut cartel so could that be coming june 10th who knows they'll say they'll reveal information as we get closer to june that seems like a good uh, time frame a little bit over a year from the last expansion. I, I don't necessarily think it's a good idea to be releasing 
a increased level cap at this point in time. I think they've just gotten balance to where they want it. We'll be talking about balance in the Wall of Crazy topic this week, but they have balance in a pretty good place right now. I think 2.6 was a very good balance update. Obviously, there are some things that still need changing, but I think they've just got it now where they have a handle on things and putting a whole new five levels and new abilities and things like that just throws a whole monkey wrench into the business. So I'm hoping that we don't see a level increase this year, maybe early next year, but maybe that's what we're seeing June 10th is a level increase in a Rise of the Hut Cartel style update. And that's where they end the year of 2014. And this is another thing a lot of people have made fun of them for is the fact that this must be the fiscal year 2014 or something, maybe the Jewish calendar for 2014, because we have no uh, no idea what's coming after that. They do talk about the new seasons, they talk about new operations, they talk about new flashpoints, they talk about all this other stuff, but they don't really give a time frame or uh, a, a calendar for those types of things. They don't really give us any... We don't really have an inkling beyond June of the size of things coming, or the frequency. Uh, will we have to wait six months for an expansion to come out? Will the expansion come out on a nine-week cycle? We don't know any of these things, and I think that's a real shame that this producer's roadmap, where they could show us and lay out what's going on in 2014, they don't really tell us anything at all. And I know this is kind of fitting to Bioware style, but it's... It's a little disingenuous to call this the producer's roadmap to 2014. This should be called the producer's roadmap to the first half of 2014. Or the producer's roadmap to summer of 14. Something like that. The spring of 2014 for SWOTOR. The spring of SWOTOR, there you go. This is the spring of SWOTOR. This is not the 2014 roadmap that I would like to see. But anyway, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Let me know. You can always tweet me at GTeague, or you can email me, new email, like I said last week, is gaddickteague at gaddickgaming.com. So if you have any strong opinions, feel free to let them be heard and let me know, and maybe I'll feature them on next week's show. And with that being said, our wall of crazy topic this week is a little bit different. It's not necessarily a specific topic or something you'd like to see added in game. We will be talking about class balance. The patch 2.6 was a big class balance patch, and there has been a lot of whining about operatives in particular. I was trying to get a, an operative to come on the show to discuss where operatives are. Did they need to be nerfed? Did they not? Because the forums have mixed opinions on them. But we will be talking about what you had to say and what you think has to happen for the next class balance update. I made a post on this Voltor subreddit. And we'll be discussing the results in the wall of crazy. What? That's impossible even for a computer! It's not impossible. I used to bullseye wall rats in my T16 back home. They're not much bigger than two meters. So as I said, this week's wall of crazy topic is a little bit different. I will be reading off some responses from my what's next for class changes post on the Swotor subreddit. Many people are calling Operative Scoundrels OP now that the changes have been implemented. I was hoping to talk to a longtime Operative Scoundrel on the show to discuss what they think because any good player worth their salt really understands if they're OP and understands that if they need to be nerfed. So I'm a little upset that I couldn't get anyone on, there was some scheduling conflicts, but I will be discussing what people have to say here and maybe next week if the Operative Scoundrels don't get nerfed this week, which I think it would be a shame if they did. I think any class change needs some time to breathe, uh, unless it's completely egregious, which I don't think it's that bad um, from my limited experience dealing with it now, but just give it some time to breathe before you nerf it back down. And I think Bioware will do that because of how long it's taken them to do anything to the Operative Scoundrel. So here, the top comment in this what's next for class changes is Assassin DPS needs some sort of increase, not an epic increase, just something to make them a little bit more formidable in PvE. And this is something I really agree with. And I think one of the few remaining class role combinations is DPS and PvP for Assassins or Shadows. 
really that might be the only the only real glaring one that I can find. I know there are a few DPS assassins out there, but they're not putting out the numbers nearly as consistently or as often as some other classes are doing. And I think that what they should do, and what I've said before about DPS assassins, is that I think that PvE tree should be the madness tree for assassins. Because I think if you do, and this is what you're seeing with the scoundrel operative, if you take a stealth class and you really buff them up for PvE, you definitely risk uh, some fallout in the PvP aspects of it. Because just the DPS coming out of stealth, popping out and just hitting someone, if the DPS is too high, the burst is too high, you'll kill them before they know what happens and they could stealth right out. No problem, no muss, no fuss, and that's just very frustrating for a player to deal with. Now what you could do is to increase the uh, sustain damage of a spec, but if you take a spec that already has really good burst damage, like Deception Assassins, they have good burst damage right now. They're per doing pretty well. I'd say that... I would say that DPS Assassins are a very formidable class in PvP. So if you give them strong sustained as well, then you end up with a problem of them having very good sustained DPS and very good burst DPS, which is something that you don't really want to mix because then you end up with a best class, best tree scenario. Now, Caden Tao responded and he took some exception to me saying that it has to be through the Madness Tree. He says that restricting options to one tree stifles the class and makes it boring. Finding a way to make Crushing Darkness part of Deception's rotations would help out a lot. And this is something I definitely agree with, that the top tier ability in the Madness Tree is a mainly PvP ability, and the Madness Tree is filled with a bunch of PvP-only talents, you know, damage reduction, things like that, um, that don't really help out their DPS so if maybe they could switch some of those in or maybe even weave some DPS elements into the damage reduction uh, area. Now I disagree with the fact that making one tree a PvE tree stifles uh, your class diversity because because let's be honest it's very difficult for multiple trees to be balanced equally and even and you almost always end up with a best spec there are very few uh instances where you don't have a best spec i think gunslingers before the nerf to orbital are probably the best example of balanced specs you know the hybrid build was uh higher dps sustained but the sharpshooter build was a little bit more bursty easier to burn down ads things like that so if you want to say everything should be like that, I think that's great, but I think it's very difficult to do something like that. And let's be honest, people end up taking the best spec. So if you already have a spec that's performing very well in player versus player, I don't see any reason to change that or you know tweak around with that to make that also good in PvE. Why not just take the spec that really doesn't do much of anything right now and make that the PvE tree? I don't see a problem with that, and I don't think many players would have a problem with that. Maybe some, obviously Caden would have a problem with that, but let me know what you think about that. I think that's a very interesting debate to be had. Do you think there's an inherent problem splitting up a PvP and a PvE tree, or do you think that every tree should be able to do everything? I mean, it's not like you're saying you can't do that, it's just, you know, kind of setting it up where one is more conducive for another. And I think that would be fine, and I think that's a way you can go to help out the PvE Assassins. I really have no specific suggestions, I've tried out a little bit of madness myself, and like he says that the crush adding Crushing Darkness to PvE would be nice. Maybe you could add some form of raid buff to Crushing Darkness, maybe it uh, gives your force users some magic penetration instead of armor penetration. Uh, that would be cool, I think. So if you have a group of a bunch of force building classes, you're going to want a shadow to give you a force break. And if you have a group of a bunch of uh, gun using DPSers, then you want an armor break. I think that's a cool dichotomy. So maybe we could see something like that added, but who knows what they'll do. I don't know. But I think this is the number one issue that they still need to address is the assassin DPS in PvE. A, another response was from uh, Giles Shunta? Giel Shunta from the Bastion, and he says, I think you need to see some changes for the other two healing classes in terms of PvP right now. 
you rarely see anything but Obscoundrel heals, and that needs to be fixed. Uh, I think this is definitely still the case, although I do think Mandos are doing very well right now. Uh, I think that the change to the shield, as well as the other few buffs that they've gotten, have really helped them out. Uh, in PvE, I'm still not sure. It's still hard to tell with such low population rank going on to tell how the best teams are handling the changes. But I could definitely see a case for adding something to the Sork to kind of bring them back up. Now I think the Sork is kind of the bottom tier healer. They, they're still great for the puddles, but I'm seeing a lot of people switch to Mandos over the Sork Sages just because of the... Uh, just because of the buffs that they received. So something to bring them up a little bit, and I still think that a scoundrel could be nerfed a little bit more. It is kind of crazy how much healing they can put out on the run while moving without any energy management problems. So I definitely expect a change for them coming in the next update. So those are just a few of the responses that I wanted to highlight. I highly just So those are just a few of the suggestions that I really wanted to highlight. I suggest that you definitely check this thread out on the Swotor subreddit. Very interesting stuff going on. If you uh, if you like the game and want to put in your two cents, definitely head over. I will link to it in the show notes. And I think that about does it for today's episode. The winner of last week's Taunt Fawn was Andrew Harris at Oxyxy. So congratulations, Andrew. You win a Taunt Fawn code. Check your inbox on Twitter. Next week's question, if you would like to win a Taunt Fawn code, all you have to do is tweet at GTEG, that's at GTEG on Twitter, with the hashtag Taunt Fawn, and answer this very simple question, what class is your main? Now, if you don't have a main, just pick your favorite class, or your favorite advanced class, I mean advanced class, of course, because that's, that's really what I'm interested in. What is your favorite, or what is your main's advanced class? So let me know, at GTEG, with the hashtag Tonfon, and you'll be entered to win a Tonfon code next week. As always, if you'd like to contact me, you can send your questions, comments, and concerns to gaddictig at gaddictgaming.com, new email, gaddictig at gaddictgaming.com, or tweet them to at gteeg, that's G-T-E-E-G -E -E on Twitter. Make sure to subscribe on iTunes to get your weekly podcast updates. If you're new to the game or thinking of resubscribing, I've provided my refer friend link in the show notes, so if you'd like a little added instead of come back, feel free to use it. You can also check out my website, gaddickgaming.com, where I post the podcast, my videos, and any other uh, musings that I have. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Unnamed Sword Horror Podcast. This is JD, signing off.